Um, hello, we are um, delighted to be back and big thanks to public programs for this opportunity to deepen and expand what was brought up in our first conversation of Apocalypse Now, Imagination and Collective Action at the End of the World. So we might call this Apocalypse Still or Apocalypse Ongoing. And I'm uh, Patrick Rainsborough, and I'm so honored um, the, to be in conversation with Zara Zimbardo. <laughs> And uh, yeah, thrilled to be continuing this conversation. Um, and we want to begin the second um, part of our conversation as we did with the first, recognizing that although we are in this nebulous virtual space, you may be listening to this as a podcast or watching us um, on YouTube, um, but we are actually grounded and in a certain place and on specific land. Um, We're in um, the land that is now called Oakland, we want to acknowledge and recognize that it is the land of the Ohlone people who have lived here since time immemorial. Um, we are settlers, we are guests on Ohlone land, um, and recognize that this uh, territory was never ceded, was never given up. It was taken by force and through a violent process of colonization. And the Ohlone people um, have been an essential part of the past of this land. They continue to be a vibrant and essential part of the present of this land. Um, preserving their culture, their traditions, their protections. Um, and most importantly, the Ohlone people are a big part of the future of this land and cre creating a vision and a path um, that pushes back against the apocalypse that's been going on for the last 500 years and ensuring that we have a vibrant cultural diversity, uh, communities that work for both indigenous and non-indigenous folks alike, and uh, focusing on making sure we have a society that preserves the web of life and works for all of our relations. So at the World Social Forum in 2003, author and activist Arundhati Roy famously said, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. We have had some quiet days, um, unusually quiet days of epic proportion during this pandemic, um, world and planet altering quiet with less noise in the oceans since the beginning of motorized ocean travel. For example, whales are less stressed and marine biologists have been listening to the more complex conversations that whales may be having. Seismologists in April reported that the Earth's upper crust was actually vibrating less with the reduction of human travel and busyness. This is stunning. And so we want to open with a question of what other worlds and what new worlds have we been hearing breathing? The conversation has been about both has been about apocalyptic narratives and particularly why apocalypse, apocalyptic thinking and why narratives matter. That relationship between apocalyptic narratives and apocalyptic realities. Um, so to, to reground us in part of that conversation, just a reminder that when we talk about the apocalypse, we're not just talking about the Christian version of the apocalypse that has been perhaps popularized by our, in the dominant culture of kind of Jesus, the sequel, cosmic smackdown, end of the world. Um, we're talking about apocalypse in the, um, the original meaning of the word, coming from the Greek, um, the lifting of the veil, the revelation, um, the seeing of what previously had been unseen. And um, that's a big part of what has been happening in this period with COVID, but is happening more broadly with an increasingly apocalyptic situation around the world of ecological collapse, growing militarism, all the various social problems and, and systemic problems that are coming to a head. And so as we begin our, our first talk with really thinking about imagination as this critical realm um, for social change, for human culture, and this question, when we bring what we are calling a narrative power analysis, an understanding of how narratives operate in relationship to existing power relationships, 
how, whose imagination are we living in? You know, and a narrative power analysis helps us think about what do stories do? The stories that we believe, what um, ideas do they make possible? What ideas do they normalize and make seem inevitable versus what ideas and what stories do they make unthinkable? That's what power means in the narrative arena. And it's central for all of us who are working for social change, for system change, for a better future, that we understand how narrative power analysis operates, particularly that we're living in a battle of the story. Um, and we're seeing it so much around COVID as people, different social forces compete to frame our understanding Narrative is how we make meaning out of the world. Um, and we can see the exact same objective reality out there, but have very different interpretations of it. And that's often the case, and that's what the battle of the story is. So that comes to what part of the purpose of apocalyptic narratives is, um, which has been what's animated so much of both Zara's and my interest in the topic of that apocalyptic narratives particularly help us um, make the invisible visible, to see new uh, things that maybe were hidden in plain sight. Um, they help us imagine what's um, been unimaginable or even just problematize that boundary between what's normal, what's not, what's imaginable, what's not. Um, apocalyptic um, narratives offer us new forms of collective action, um, teaching us new ways of, of being. And that ultimately, an apocalyptic narrative is about the end of something, the end of the world as we know it, if you will. And the way that, that what we create in those type of apocalyptic narratives, both in our fictional world and in our lived realities, is very revealing about what type of new beginnings um, are possible. So those are some of the themes we wanted to ground ourselves in as we get back into this conversation about apocalypse, imagination, and collective action. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And in this, um, you know, in this conversation and the different um, ideas or perspectives we're wanting to lift up, we're weaving back and forth between fiction and nonfiction and exploring some of these like eerie or uncanny or liberatory um, relationships. And so just to speak on a, you know, broad level, um, there is this convergence <laughs> in space and time between dystopian or apocalypse or post-apocalyptic fiction and current reality, right? So not as much um, the sci-fi, traditional sci-fi, which is like hundreds of centuries in the future and on a different planet, perhaps, but like worlds that resemble ours or are ours or are just a few degrees away or more extreme of what we're experiencing right now or the day after tomorrow. Um, and, you know, there's been a number of uh, images of different bookstores that have put up a little sign saying post-apocalyptic fiction has been moved to the current affairs section, right? In a tongue-in-cheek way, but it is speaking to this, our bizarre sci-fi and non-sci-fi times that we live in. Um, I want to lift up three themes um, around apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction. Um, one is as we enter into these fictional realms through whatever types of medium, literature, TV, film, etc., it's this dual movement of a journey out and then a journey home, right? So we journey out as an audience, as readers, um, into this radically altered world and landscape. Um, and, you know, often that is traveling to a dead or dying world. And it gives us this particular vantage point that we can occupy to look at this dead world and question what it valued. And then we journey home, right, when the story finishes with a different kind of perception, seeing things in a different way and can question what this world values. Um, through um, imaginative fiction, we're connecting with characters and seeing how they're navigating constantly shifting circumstances that are often um, 
frightening, incredibly uncertain and unstable of this unfamiliar reality. And we're seeing how they're figuring things out, how they're experimenting, how they're failing, how they're succeeding, how they're needing to constantly update their schemas of understanding reality, like with dystopian plague or alien invasion narratives, it's constantly like, okay, now we have this new understanding of what the threat is and how does that change our response and what's getting summoned within humans to meet this other. Um, and thirdly, just wanna bring up that so much, you know, apocalyptic, dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction can function as a giant thought experiment about what it means to be human in this radically altered landscape where everything familiar has, or you know, almost everything familiar has fallen away. And to question like, who would I be? Who would we be in this landscape as we project ourselves um, into that future space, um, right? With the uh, huge popularity around zombie apocalypse. This was this common refrain hearing it, kids and adults saying, what would you do in the zombie apocalypse? And it's like, why are we all asking that question, right? Um, how would we respond? And this question of what it means to be human, what holds us together when all infrastructure and systems and the global economy fades away, um, right? Who are we? Well, on the speculative fiction, tip, you know, particularly in, in my work around climate, it's been impossible to ignore the rise of a whole new genre out there of, of cli-fi, as it's called, climate fiction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, and it speaks to the fact as climate disruption becomes so visible in people's lives and part of the popular imagination, of course, this is the realm of speculative fiction um, to be preparing us for and helping us process um, challenging um, realities that seem imminent. And, in and the case anxieties. Of, exactly, yeah. In the case of climate change, there's incredible anxiety because we're all literally seeing the collapse of our climate system um, right before us. Um, you know, in terms of speculative fiction and its role um, that becomes relevant for collective action, I think of it in two particular ways, how speculative fiction can act as a mirror and how it can act as a telescope. And the mirror is um, social critique, is showing us what is, holding up a mirror so that we maybe see what's already normal, normal in quotes there, um, in a different way. Whereas the, the telescope is the vision oriented, is looking into the future a little, showing us what's, mm. what's possible, um, maybe where we could go. And both of those, um, both of those roles are incredibly important when it comes to cli-fi in particular, that particular apocalyptic narrative that we're all living through. Um, you know, and you see in, if you think about some of the movies, some of the books, it's become such a big theme. You know, this is where we're working out the next one step further into the future, the kind of extreme drought or the rising tides or the militarism and refugee crises that climate is, um, is unleashing. Um, and, particularly, you know, pivoting into how we operate in that narrative space as organizers, as activists concerned about climate. This is in a narrative power analysis, foreshadowing is a huge part of how we do a narrative power analysis. And foreshadowing just meaning looking at how the story is telegraphing its end, um, telling us and giving us signals of, of where it's going. And in in climate organizing, this is a huge tension for us between the obvious kind of um, doom and collapse and, and unhappy ending of the current trajectory of our fossil fuel based economy um, that naturally leads to some of the sense of fear and anxiety versus how we foreshadow um, hope and equity and a positive transition. And that tension between the tragic outcome and the happy outcome um, is, 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 a, is a challenge running through all climate change communication right now. Um, and particularly, um, you know, if we, if we recognize one of the things that doing narrative work that we originally learned from advertising is that people will only go someplace that they've already been in their minds. It's so important that we foreshadow for folks um, what the outcome of participating in a campaign is, what the outcome of engaging in a social movement is. Um, and in the case of the climate crisis, we, 
people sense the scale of that problem, we have to make sure that we're giving them solutions that operate at that same scale. And that's why across the board in particularly frontline led climate movements um, around the world, there's been such a pivot to system change, to recognizing that there is no way um, to tell a happy ending to the climate story in our current economic and political system. And we therefore need to tell viable stories that show not only that system change, again, economic change, getting off fossil fuels, political change, stopping being ruled by corporations that emphasize only greed and extraction, these kind of massive levels of change, paradigm shift, um, that we have to show that not only these are possible, but that they're urgent and underway. Hmm. And as a climate, I appreciate you raising just that tension for people who are working um, in this arena. Um, and as something that you often point out is that we're already living on a radically changed earth. Like already the climate is radically destabilized and that some of that climate fiction is showing this trajectory if we continue stay this course. Like Absolutely. This is where it is, where it is going so that we can again journey home with some sense of shock and wonder and um, shaking us out of our trance. Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is not the earth that humans evolved on in terms of greenhouse gas levels, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're at the highest levels in 3 million years. Our ancestors 3 million years ago were not homo sapiens. Um, so thinking about the scale of change that has happened and the fact that we're rapidly moving into a world that's not only the same world that nurtured human civilization over the last 10,000 years, but isn't even the world that we um, evolved in as a species in terms of the climactic conditions. Right. Um, and just to underscore, you know, that core theme in apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction, um, sci-fi, cli-fi is like that, like what does it mean to be human, but also like what are humans becoming? What are we becoming? Mm -hmm which can help us to ask some of those brave and curious questions um, in the present. Um, so I want to pivot um, as we're, um, you know, starting to go through this transition out of quarantine and to just reflect as so many people have been doing about what are some of the glimpses of what is possible on a mass scale that we have experienced. Um, so recently there's been all kinds of graduations from school for folks of all ages, um, adapting these rituals to be physically distanced. Um, I am an educator, huge shout out to educators <laughs> all around Yay, at all educators. levels. <laughs> um, can't be enough praise. Um, and just to, you know, acknowledge that of what was unthinkable, <laughs> that all education would move online to distance learning. It would have been like, you know, some weeks back, like what, why? No, never going to happen. And in a matter of days went from unthinkable to thinkable to necessary to mandatory. Um, and millions of people working together, students, teachers, administrators, um, in like a, you know, traditional like wartime effort um, to make this happen. Um, you know, acting like millions of bees in a digital <laughs> hive um, with a tremendous amount of labor, tremendous amount of support, tremendous amount of struggle, tremendous amount of humor. Um, Right, tremendous amount of um, sharing of resources around pandemic pedagogy. Um, and not to say that this is like all a good thing, um, huge problematics and downsides to all education being online, also a lot of upsides. The point being is that we did that in like a week. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is uh, I think, some of the most inspiring and powerful lessons that are coming out of this pandemic is, you, as you referenced, like a wartime mobilization. I think in the dominant culture, that's one of the few models that we have, one of the few stories we're told of dramatic change. Oh, in World War II, the entire economy shifted. 
Um, and it's sort of like, well, if we can do it in a war where the goal is to kill our fellow human beings, can we do it in some other setting where the goal is actually to, to protect save? our fellow human yeah. beings? Yeah, and, right. and to care for one another and care ourselves. So I think that's an incredible lesson. I think as we talked about in the first session, the mask itself is a very powerful symbol, what sometimes in, in narrative work we call the symbol and the thing. It's the way that an abstract idea comes to life in a real example, because the mask is not about protecting yourself. The mask is about protecting others. So it's a real intervention in some ways in the control mythology of individual, of rugged individualism. That's so much at mm -hmm. the core of the American pioneer, um, sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of mythology, which has been such a toxic and dangerous narrative. Um, and the mask and self is- Self-protection at the expense of others. Exactly, yeah. And so just the fact that these masks and us taking that activity and for people to understand that, you know, it's about the collective action is what makes it valuable. It doesn't matter unless we all do it, or at least a critical percentage. Um, so, you know, that's the type of solidarity that social movements have always cultivated. It is a, a sense of shared uh, collective interest, self-interest expanded. And I think the way that the COVID pandemic has been forcing us to expand our sense of who the we is beyond just, of course, I care and want to protect my family and my neighbors and my community, but actually to keep expanding that we to say, I have common interest with people across the country, um, across communities, across nations, across the world, across the species boundary, um, that ultimately that's the kind of collective action and expanded sense of self-interest that we need to confront the climate crisis. Yeah, I just wanna name right again of this connection between fiction and reality that how often, like with what you're talking about, that systemic problems can feel so daunting and so overwhelming um, because they are so entrenched and it often seems like we need something supernatural. Um, to be able to unite us and to transcend our differences and figure things out um, on a mass scale. Um, and, you know, extraterrestrials have often helped us out with this in terms of alien invasion. Like that is the existential threat where we see this depicted of world leaders saying like, we need to um, come together to rise to meet this. Um, you know, otherwise we will be annihilated. Um, so typically, right, aliens have had a knack for helping us with that. Um, and that might be a reason why we keep summoning them to say, say like, this is possible, this is possible, this is possible, um, even though it's when it seems impossible. Well, I'm just chuckling at that idea, as you say, the way that we summon the aliens and since we keep casting them in the stories that we create to play that role, and I'm, um, I'm chuckling because from the climate space, it's something <laughs> that, you know, after years of trying to overcome fossil fuel industry propaganda about the climate crisis, many of us have joked that it would be easier to explain to people that what's actually happening is the planet is being terraformed and that we're living in some bad X-Files spinoff <laughs> where this planet is being prepared for extraterrestrial colonization and all of this fossil fuel use um, that makes no sense because why would we destroy our one and only home? Well, apparently our alien overlords like more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because that's that's certainly the path that we've been on for the last 200 years and are now rapidly crossing the threshold of. Um, so to come back, um, as Patrick, you were just talking about around this um, different meaning of apocalypse is lifting the veil as disclosure of knowledge as revelation. Um, so much has been revealed in this pandemic time. Um, and so just to kind of come to return to this, um, you know, <laughs> we're about halfway through 2020. Um, and so far, it seems like 2020 has been a year of relentless lessons of gaining 2020 vision into what ails us. Um, right, this pandemic has forced us to think in different ways at different levels, thinking microbially, thinking systemically, 
economically um, and ecologically. Um, and so, right, what is being revealed <laughs> um, on this microbial level? It's just stunning to acknowledge um, how this invisible microscopic realm has become hyper visible as we've become hyper aware and hyper vigilant um, around, um, you know, contagion, um, constantly cleaning off fingerprints, right? How do we integrate this knowledge moving forward, um, knowing that we are all kinds of uh, microbes, you know, operate within us and that we evolved with, right? So how are we integrating some of this new knowledge and awareness? Well, and particularly on the collective action front, as you're saying, these different levels, people's awareness of microbes, people's awareness of the pandemic, it creates a shared narrative logic that I think folks are able to intervene in. Again, as we talked about in the first um, in our first session, one of the ways that we can change stories, even really entrenched stories, is through our own collective action to intervene in the story. And so I'm thinking here of some of the amazing work that's happened um, in the Bay Area, San Francisco advocates for the houseless community and folks who are unhoused themselves, um, reframing our understanding of the pandemic to say, hey, you know, there's an illness, there's a cure. One of the cures is housing. <laughs> housing is a cure you know, or folks in, in other movements and other places that have helped us say, of course, the virus itself is causing a lot of pain and suffering, but really in an era of for-profit healthcare and big pharmaceutical manipulation, um, the real disease is greed. Greed is what's killing each other. So it's just a good example when we're thinking about and practicing how to intervene in narratives apocalyptic narratives and shared experience in general provide a specific narrative logic that we can um, utilize and use it to reframe to help people see things in different ways. That's one of the ways that the battle of the story really comes to life um, in these right. kind of moments. Yeah, and is a, is a particular relationship with this virus, mm -hmm. right? There's many different types of relationships with this virus and um, I mean, just the fact that we can all picture what the little microbe looks like, like the virus right. is really we a can character see the in our daily spiky lives. Spiky crown yeah. corona, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that question again: Who are we becoming in relation to it? Like in relationship to this virus, right? And in terms of thinking systemically related, Patrick, to what you were just lifting up, um, as the virus has traveled and spread it has been shining a systematically shining a light on vulnerable conditions, right? So in prisons, um, houseless communities, nursing homes, detention centers, being aware of touch heavy industries, right? So it's lighting up these high risk conditions. And then as you were just talking about, then activists working to shine an even brighter spotlight and widen the frame of saying like, what conditions are we talking about that the virus is now directing our attention to in a different way? Um, and, you know, a number of people have commented in different ways around how COVID-19 amplifies pre-existing illnesses within the human body. Um, and it amplifies structural illnesses, right? As you were just talking about. Um, and, right, as these different um, areas light up with concern and fear and awareness, we see how all kinds of amazing workers are flowing in like white blood cells to strengthen our collective immune system. And that being a key project to continue. I love that metaphor of our, our movements and our collective action as the white blood cells of the planet. <laughs> it resonates so much with the reality of what's happening. Um, so let's look at um, economically for a moment. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously a huge... And the veils falling yeah, away. Yeah, this is a huge arena of um, struggle and contestation because economy is kind of the control ideology, uh, economics, if you will, is kind of the control um, ideology of our modern system. And we talked a great deal in the first um, session about specific COVID narratives and what it what it raises for us around, you know, at any time you're trying to make structural change, it's important to come to the core of the purpose, to make 
um, visible the invisible. What is the purpose of government? What is the purpose of the economy? Because it's it's when we when we fight. Um, on that level of meaning, that's when we can make real structural change. And one of the things that's been so obvious uh, that's been exposed is just around monetary policy, which even saying the words monetary policy makes most people like yawn and fall asleep. Monetary policy in terms of the way the government deals with the money supply is been before this kind of successfully presented as a fairly technocratic, even objective area that should be left to the experts. Now the cat is out of the bag. It's clearly a political arena. Uh, the reality is the United States government creates money. Money's not real. Debt is not real. These are all systems of exchange we use to manage our economy. And so the idea that whereas in the past, um, the message was, well, there's unlimited money for war and prisons and those kind of things. But of course, there's no money for healthcare or education or parks. Um, we now know what a lie that is. I mean, the Republicans are clinging to their traditional um, deficit sort of narrative um, that we don't have money and trying to shut down um, the efforts around um, stimulus. But the cat is out of the bag, as they say. We now know that that is there, that we can be fighting for the money. It's a global pandemic. We need universal health care. We needed universal health care before this pandemic, but it's deadly obvious now why we need universal health care. Um, we need a New Deal style jobs program. I mean, if we're in a Great Depression, most folks understand how we got out of the Great Depression was mm -hmm. the, the, the New Deal. Um, and I think it's not an if right now. That's right. If we're in a <laughs> as you're figuring it out yeah and and you know particularly that we can solve multiple problems um with mm -hmm. our with our interventions by having a government that actually serves the collective interests rather than the government that we have right now which is largely um serving elite and corporate interests um then we can we can recognize that we can address the ecological and economic problems at the same time because ultimately they're the flip side of the same coin and that's some of the power of, of proposals that have moved in the last year around the Green New Deal. Whereas we recognize that we have to make an incredible transition in our economy. That's an opportunity for an, millions, tens of millions of new meaningful jobs, transitioning energy, transitioning our food system so that um, the just recovery that we're fighting for right now in that framework becomes a broader just transition off of a fossil fuel extraction based economy and into a renewable energy regenerative and more equitable um, economy um, that's that's part of the role of that monetary policy and how the government uses its money um, can be supporting that kind of change and that's one of the veils that has been that has been lifted mm -hmm. yeah and patrick as you um often you know point out it's like transition is happening <laughs> transition mm -hmm. will happen the question is whether it will be just or not mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of right ecologically um, some of the veils that have been parting um, and different types of perception and knowledge um, becoming into focus what is some of what we've been seeing during this pandemic animals <laughs> Right, wild animals coming into urban spaces, right? Some of this rewilding happening in a pretty short time. Um, and this um, has been, you know, pretty astounding for people to behold in terms of around the world to be aware of our impact and our relationship with extra humans, um, the extra human worlds, different species. And I'm particularly struck by how some of these images of urban rewilding and of totally empty um, cities is something that we that you often see in post apocalyptic, you know, cinema and television um, images of empty streets, the iconic image of the empty highway from the zombie apocalypse right everything has completely stopped and you're seeing um, human survivors walking through familiar built landscapes that are incredibly strange now and um, unnervingly quiet. Um, right, and so we see some of these images of destruction and regeneration and something that struck me from this uh, pandemic time is there's been a lot of, you know, images and some drone video, video footage 
around different cities like San Francisco, right? Where you're seeing no humans, maybe one person walking in the distance, a pigeon, rock dove crossing the street. And some people commenting on these videos saying, this looks like the end of the world, right? Because it does. This is what we've already seen so many times. And then other people saying, this is what love looks like, or this is what mass cooperation on an unprecedented level that we've never known before looks like. Very different meanings um, or interpretations of the same. Ba battle the story right there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, um, you know, I, I think it's important to say the way this sh economic shutdown is happening is not a just transition. It's not equitable. It's causing incredible harm, um, including, you know, massive food insecurity, starvation, <laughs> anxiety. This is not a model of a just transition. But it is revealing that when the shutdown of our economy leads to um, cleaner air, um, clean water, when it leads to streets that used to be full of traffic now are, are full of children playing, as is the case in some places where streets have been shut down, um, when it leads to more time with our families. Um, when all of these positive things come out, it does reveal that something is fundamentally wrong with our current economy, right? That we're not able to provide those in our current economy. Um, that instead we have this doomsday spiral of a fossil fuel addicted and consumer capitalist economy that is failing to um, meet our basic needs, um, failing to meet the material needs of many people, to be clear, because that's its big claim is like, hey, at least we're creating material prosperity. It's not even doing that, but it's also ravaging the ecological, psychological, and spiritual needs of so many more of us. Mm -hmm. So to re-invoke um, Arundhati Roy, um, who's been a real guiding light thinker in this time, um, she has put forward this um, framework of pandemic as portal, which has really resonated with people around the world. Um, and I just wanna read her direct words on this, saying historically, Pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Um, so relating to Patrick, what you were saying of this, the urgency to find other ways. And what mm -hmm. I appreciate so much about her formulation of pandemic as portal is that it centers human agency and it's also neutral, right? So we are being changed, we are being shaped and we are shaping, right? We are not passive actors in this, right? We can be choosing what we are bringing through this opening, um, coming about from this rupture um, and we and it's and it's active and liberatory to think about what are we letting go right um, hospicing dying ideologies of separateness and supremacy um, right and that sense that right nothing is inevitable everything is possible um, and that stretching of imagination and possibility that happens um, in a time like this right in a shifting of radical reorganization of the world. Um, I saw on social media recently, someone posted saying, you know, I just don't see bras making a comeback after this, right? So all or kinds people, people of- People wearing hard pants, as they've been right. saying. Right, instead of sweatpants or pajamas, right? Mm -hmm. So all kinds of rearranging and remapping of meanings from our everyday practices to thinking about these larger systems. Um, and again, the neutrality of the portal, that it's not inherently moral, good or bad, not divinely ordained. This is not a plague sent by the gods or by a divine agenda from Mother Earth, but only that it exists and it's about what we make of it. Reminding yeah. us that anything manufactured can be dismantled and mm -hmm. often science fiction helps us with that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, it resonates with what we were talking about in our first session, the notion of the psychic break, a moment when there's a rupture in a commonly held narrative. We mm -hmm. see this all the time in, in dramatic events when people, you know, uh, a 9-11, a hurricane, uh, the election of Donald Trump, when people, something people <clears throat> thought was impossible suddenly becomes possible, it starts to make people question their underlying assumptions. Um, and COVID is certainly that type of a psychic break in showing us what's what's possible, um, you know, and, and I think we've seen the fight all over the world about normal. What does it mean yes. to go back to normal? And people are just, of course, there's many things we probably do want to go back to. I look forward to having conversations that are not on Zoom <laughs> and that are in real life. Um, but the larger opportunity is to change our understanding of what's normal and to make sure that it's a normal that, um, that's, that works for everyone, um, that we've now seen our agency. We've seen that if we have the power to stop this current economy, we should have the collective power to start a new economy that's the kind of economy that we want. Mm. A, um, a, I don't know what to call it, a slogan, a saying that I saw recently that I really appreciated it said, may we grow back not to what was, but instead towards what we can become, mm -hmm. right? So lots of normal where folks are excited to get back to and looking at the normal that is bring, has brought us to this global calamity. Mm -hmm. um, so we are talking on Zoom <laughs> right now as a bajillion other people are, <laughs> right? This, um, right, so much of, uh, Life has moved online um, in a like exponential way with this pandemic, um, right? All of, right, in this, um, you know, touch apocalypse that we've been going through, right? In terms of needing to have physical distance, technological platforms and devices have been the way, have been supporting all of our human connectivity. Right. So everything, all of the distance learning, all of the connection, all of the rituals, all of the amazing support resources, um, all of the forms of um, just incredible creativity and innovation pouring out in this time. Um, so much of the mutual aid organizing is happening on Google Docs. Right. And circulating so folks can collaborate that way. And so, right, all of this human beauty is also being data mined, um, right? Endlessly sold to third party companies to increasingly predict consumer behavior, being tracked, being geolocated, being surveilled um, as we're in this intensifying uh, surveillance state and era of surveillance capitalism can really feel the walls closing in. I mean, that was happening for before this pandemic in terms of the role of the tech conglomerates, some of the largest, most powerful companies in the world, the Googles, the Amazons, um, Apple, um, that their role in our lives is becoming more and more central. I think of it as real enclosure. Mm -hmm. Um, continuing on that tradition that's been going on for the last 400 years of the way that that capitalism has increasingly enclosed more and more of our lives. And, you know, I think one of the very useful frameworks in terms of naming a kind of an elite playbook that happens over and over again, we talked about in our first session, um, Naomi Klein's work on the shock doctrine and understanding the shock doctrine as a kind of uh, Part of the elite playbook, the idea that when a shock happens to the system, a disaster, a disruption, a war, that a bunch of um, powerful corporate and government interests are already ready with a pre-existing agenda to step in and move that agenda rapidly when people are disoriented um, and, dis and things are disrupted. And, you know, this, the origins of it coming back to Pinochet's um, Chile, but a whole model of disaster capitalism that's happened over and over again. And with that context, it's notable, um, you know, Naomi wrote a piece uh, about a month ago outlining um, some of the ways, the maneuvering of what a shock doctrine around COVID looks like. And particularly um, this idea of a screen new deal, like the computer screen and the way that 
already there's government and corporate schemes to privatize that very same distance learning that um, you were talking about earlier, I'm sorry, to make sure that we found a way to eliminate more of the public sphere um, to have charter schools and privatization to accelerate um, healthcare in the way to be accelerating automation um, in the way that Amazon has already been trying to do. And of course, the surveillance technologies are absolutely chilling. Um, obviously, from a public health perspective, we all want to see contact tracing and we need to, in order to survive this moment, understand that. But you can see it's the Pandora's box. You can see that a lot mm -hmm. of these technologies, once we start allowing governments and corporations to geolocate and track our cell phone information to be able to trace how the disease is spreading, what happens next? Where does that go? How do we put that genie back in the bottle? And those are very serious questions, I think, in this kind of apocalyptic scenario that we're in, how to make sure that we're not taking a step closer to techno-fascism, really. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling chilled, even though it's yeah. a heat wave today in Oakland, um, hearing you <laughs> say this. Um, right, in that often new technology or biotechnology is often sold as necessary for human health or safety, which makes it very difficult to say no or opt out or ask questions. Um, right, and Silicon Valley tech bro culture loves disruption. And this is a time of epic disruption. And right, while pandemics have been a long part of human history, and they may certainly be a big part of our future with different viruses jumping species or emerging from the melting Arctic permafrost, right? That itself there is like a hundred um, sci-fi plot, movie plot or premises. That one's like, coming for sure. This pandemic is the first of the digital age. Um, and yeah, so just to acknowledge this historic time of so much um, uncertainty and so many forces that are um, pointing to different trajectories of where we might go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we all the time deal with uh, the techno fix narrative. I think mm -hmm. one of the most common control mythologies that shows up, um, basically the idea that technology will save us. Um, and to be clear, of course, technology has a, solu has a role to play in many solutions, but the techno fix narrative uh, elevates technology as the sole solution and makes technology seem like it is um, neutral and has no relationship with existing um, power relations with the existing kind of social economic structures that we have. So, you know, it's genetically engineered plants will solve world hunger, even though if you know anything about genetically engineered plants, they have nothing to do with hunger. They're to do with selling pesticides for companies, you know, or police brutality will be solved by police cameras. Um, sure, police cameras might help, but that's not going to magically address structural racism and police brutality. Um, so that we're seeing that a bunch, I think, in COVID opens up lots of spaces for that. And the Technofix narrative, um, you know, it's, it's, it's ruthless sibling, if you will, is the market will save us. And these two go together very mm -hmm. nicely in that very as you were saying, disruptive tech bro culture, which has grown into these multi um, billion dollar global conglomerates. Right, and just mm -hmm. to name with what you were saying earlier about Screen New Deal, mm -hmm. that um, there's this huge push um, for big tech to profit from a no touch world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and just to remind ourselves that any so-called solution that's going to be rolled out, that's being rolled out through a privatized corporate platform rather than a public um, platform, profits built in, profits part of the model, part of the design. Um, and when you're talking about life and death, healthcare, basic human needs, basic human contact, that's obscene to make profit. Um, mm an extraction of profit from people um, part of the conditions. But, you know, I mean, it speaks to particularly following the techno fix theme from COVID into our ongoing climate apocalypse. We see it most dramatically in that space. 
um, you know, technology will save us in the climate space looks like the glamorization of billionaires, that Elon Musk or Bill Gates or some really smart person will come with some magic technology. So it means, oh, we don't need to have system change. We don't need to change our consumption habits. We don't need to create a more equitable global economy. We'll just come up with some magic new technology that will happen. And most alarmingly, what this is increasingly looking like is geoengineering technologies, which talk about an apocalypse right there. You know, for folks who aren't familiar with geoengineering, this is the idea of planetary engineering, that we've gone so far in disrupting the climate of our planet that we actually need to go further. So this is kind of crazy ideas like spraying um, aerosols in the upper atmosphere or um, wasn't that called Operation Silver Lining? <laughs> there's like the all, reflective particles. The reflective particles. There's one also that's um, about putting reflective stuff all over uh, the ice caps. Um, the ideas of, of ocean fertilization, which is to put um, create giant algae blooms in the ocean and suck down a bunch of carbon. And yeah, nothing could go wrong. Yeah, exactly. What could go wrong? Who could imagine? And just to be clear, in all these cases, what you largely have is engineers coming up with this techno fix idea that like it's not a structural situation it's not a system change we're just going to come up with this little technique so something like the algae blooms every single marine biologist in the world it's like that's a crazy idea but it doesn't matter there's still companies being founded and created not by marine biologists but by engineers who are going to then the combination of the techno fix narrative and the market will save us narrative say let's start a company that allows fossil fuel companies to keep polluting because we'll create offsets, um, carbon credits, and we'll say, okay, don't worry, you can keep polluting because we're gonna create algae blooms in the ocean and suck carbon out of the atmosphere. It's a bizarre idea, and it's, it's, if we can't name it and challenge it, it becomes very hard to um, intervene because as we get further and further down the climate disaster and climate destabilization, the shock doctrine comes into effect and people are so desperate to do something that we will, we're willing to try anything. Um, and that's a very serious start. That's why we have to name the techno fix narrative um, early and often right. to be able to resist it. Right, and that gets magnified in cli-fi like Snowpiercer. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a great example. You know, Which can help us don't... see it in a different way. Exactly. You know, so for folks who saw the, I think it was 2013 movie Snowpiercer, um, that's the first cli-fi movie where the world is destroyed not by climate change, but by the technological intervention that we do to try to stop climate change. And therefore, Snowpiercer is set in a world that's been frozen solid by some sort of um, geoengineering gone wrong. And so great example of as we were talking about with speculative fiction, the mirror and the telescope, holding up some of the current um, situations in our, in our society and also showing a cautionary tale of what could go wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and so with, you know, this narrative, a dominant narrative of technology will save us, right, and all the techno fixes being rolled out or proposed, right, further along that spectrum are techno-utopian fantasies. Right, mm -hmm. that technology will not only fix our problems and save us, but will actually bring about certain utopias, um, which are often seen as transcendent, um, transcending the limitations of the earth and the nat natural environment, transcending the limitations. Um, I'm putting quotes for people, <laughs> air quotes for folks who are listening on the podcast, the limitations of the human body um, and the senses. Um, the limitations of mortality, right? Where it's like consciousness can be uploaded and humans can be free and don't need to be struggling more on a struggling planet. Um, certainly everything that I just said, that sounds like techno dystopia to me, <laughs> right? That yeah. those, those dreams are my nightmares. Um, and, well, I mean, the, the yeah. entire discourse that's happening around the technological singularity. Um, right. you know, folks may be familiar with the idea that we're heading towards an event horizon where technology will move so rapidly, we'll have a kind of techno sure, if you will, merge with machines, whatever it looks like. You know, this And is become the, something different that we can't yet imagine, yeah, right? And, and that it, being shown seen as, or presented as something that's inevitable. Exactly. And it seems like a kind of crazy fringe idea, but to understand how incredibly popular this idea <laughs> is with the tech billionaires of Silicon Valley. 
um, you know, that this is a huge economic and political project that is underway to imagine and help create this. Right. And that's, again, where we see this remarkable convergence of longtime science fiction themes and then science nonfiction realities, right? And um, which, and things that were, you know, unthinkable becoming thinkable and then becoming actually funded and becoming politically viable. And one of the most literally out there examples, right, is Mars colonization, something that's been explored um, for a long time in science fiction, imagining human colonies on Mars. And we're at this time now where that is a funded project with a timeline, a lot of backing in this privatized space race. And a lot of it also is responding to um, apocalyptic realities on Earth saying we need to find other ways for the survival of humans and this desire to like reset human civilization on another planet. Like, okay, there's no atmosphere, there's no baggage. Again, what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? That is really the, that's the key phrase here. But I mean, with all due respect to um, Gil Scott Heron, we've gone from Whitey on the moon to Whitey on Mars. I mean, this is a white billionaire fantasy that has animated um, so much resourcing and so much trajectory. And, and just to reiterate the perversion of that, that these amount of resources are following that apocalyptic fantasy, transforming, as you said, through tech utopianism into a utopian fantasy, those resources should be going into maintaining the life support systems of this planet. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, but it does show how narrative animates us and the narratives that we allow to become dominant in our culture shape the trajectory of our political, economic, and cultural agendas. And that's why it's so important that we are able to name them and intervene in them. So much more to say there. <laughs> um, but I want to also kind of bring in the, right, so there's the technology will save us. And then there's also the dominant narrative. Again, long time themes explored through different types of fiction, that technology will destroy us, right? And so there's a long um, tradition, different genres of like around robots and a fear of robot takeover and robotic uprising. And it's- uh, That's my favorite apocalypse, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm for it. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> right, and it's helpful to uh, know that historically, where the word robot um, is a Czech word, which means compulsory labor, right, or slave. And so the fantasy of robots has always been this fantasy largely around labor and creating humans creating robots that have no will, that don't need to rest, that don't need sustenance, right? Um, and we'll just be able to carry out all the work humans don't want to do, liberating humans for a life of leisure. And then things don't go as planned, or the robots overcome their programming in some way, um, or they become self-aware, and the master-slave relationship gets flipped, right? So this has been a long-time theme of processing some of these anxieties of this relationship between humans and machines, and who are we becoming in this relationship as human as robots can be portrayed as terrifying as helpful as adorable in some ways as more human and ways that humans are then shown to be more mechanical um, and so folks have been thinking about this for a long time and here we are in the present in these sci-fi times of this right like almost total convergence where automated labor is everywhere, um, where algorithms are increasingly directing our consumer behavior and directing us towards more um, extremist and polarized views in our media consumption, right? Bots are the majority on the internet. Humans, we are the minority now, right? The, the takeover <laughs> happened, right? We need to constantly go through these little captchas. I'm not a robot to get through these gateways to show that we're humans. Um, right, artificial intelligence becoming more racist and sexist, 
um, as well as machine learning happening in ways that the folks who are really driving it say, we have no idea what's going to happen. And again, saying that it's somehow inevitable. Um, right? How many of us have robot servants, so to speak, who we rely on or kids growing up with robots that have a feminine sounding voice, right? Whether that's the like eternally chipper uh, femme robot voice of like, how can I help you? And I'm sorry, I'm afraid I didn't understand the question, right? Or the soothing femme GPS bot lady voice of like, Turn left in 1.4 miles. The, the series, the Alexi, Alexis's like. Right. And so like what is going on with that in this relationship? Um, and I think it's a very interesting contrast around um, the robot fears and fantasies and anxieties um, contrasting with Right, and like you were talking about, Patrick, this singularity, right? The convergence of humans and um, machines and computers um, contrast with the undead and zombie apocalypse narratives, which are often on some level about a total breakdown of technology and saying, who are we in the face of that, right? There is, it's a specter of total unplugging, right? Nothing works anymore including all of our communications, all of our devices, right? There, is no, there are no status updates in the zombie apocalypse. There are no selfies. The signal is dead. And so that's been a big part of what folks have been imagining through that genre of like, who are we um, without being networked in this way, right? Like, how do we define ourselves? How do we communicate? How do we function on basic levels? And that being a vision of um, horror and maybe also some kind of longing to be, uh, it's like a drastic way out from our networked realities where it seems like mm -hmm. there is um, no way out. Yeah, just the notion of escape fantasies. <laughs> We're all, so many of us are looking for escape from um, the current increasingly apocalyptic realities that we're living in. You know, and that, that's how we began um, the, con the first part of this conversation was uh, an inquiry into when you think about the apocalypse, what's easy to imagine? Um, what's harder to imagine? What's easy to imagine? What quickly comes in? Um, it comes to mind the, the famous quote by the critical um, theorist um, Frederick Jameson, where he said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Or a shout out to a great piece that you wrote on zombies, <laughs> Zara, I believe the title was, it's easier to imagine the zombie apocalypse than the end of capitalism. Because the, 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 the way the system colonizes our imagination and makes us think that there are no alternatives means that in order to break out of a, of a pathological and harmful system that we find ourselves in, we have to think of elaborate apocalypse narratives. And that's part of the, the liberatory potential of apocalypse narratives, right? But, you know, the fact that it's, it's easier to imagine an asteroid hitting the earth than it is to imagine that we're going to make a, a rapid shift to a sustainable and equitable economy. I think if you were to poll people, you know, so which one's more likely? Um, you know, and I think it speaks to one of the themes we've been uh, returning to frequently here is the crisis of imagination that is at the center of our culture. We talked about the Tina control mythology in our first session, that there is no alternative, um, the preposterousness um, of that. Um, but it shows that we as social movements, we as agents of change, have to constantly be exercising that muscle of collective imagination to imagine together. Um, we can't go there until we've created it in our minds. And that's why imagination is so important to collective action. And you know, this is one of the aspects that um, I think is really hopeful and empowering about extremely bleak and grim genres <laughs> in dystopian and apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction is that Right, unlike some superhero catharsis where you kind of know how things are gonna end and order will be restored, I think it's really interesting to look at in these more dystopian forms of fiction, the ending, the note that it ends on, 
right? As we've been following this, the characters this whole time, right? Where everything known has fallen away and it often ends on a note of profound uncertainty, like a big maybe that things will shift or that there will be a livable future. Um, and that un deep unsettlingness um, feels very hopeful to me um, because right, that's where we shift from being audience to author and can write fan fiction in real life, right? Where does the story go? How do we want it to continue? What are we doing with this unsettled feeling, right? And so looking at some of those ending notes, which are about new beginnings, is something, is something fascinating to pay attention to, right? Like in the film Children of Men, which is about an infertility epidemic um, among Great humans movie. on earth, right? That is upending everything. And it ends with one miraculously pregnant person who is on a small rowboat named Tomorrow, drifting off on a gray sea in a gray haze, right? There's just that possibility of tomorrow or Wally, the G-rated um, apocalypse myth um, where the earth has been made uninhabitable because of our trash. And there's this little trash compacting robot who's sifting through all the artifacts of our civilization. And at the end, there's a plant restart icon that gets triggered and there's one sprout. And it just ending on that possibility of a sprout that may make it or may not. And so I think it's ent interesting to look at those um, narrative and emotional ending tones that are pointing to beginnings that we carry forth. Yeah, I mean, we want to upgrade the apocalypse. Right now we've got some crappy apocalypses. We need some better apocalypses. We need liberatory apocalypses that are actually, as we lift this veil and transition, and as you were saying before, go out to some place. We need that place we're going out to to not be a dead world. Um, we need to get past um, the way the kind of apocalyptic scripts that are just working out the same old um, reenacting, the same old oppression and violence and, and domination. Right, and rehearsing the same futures. Yeah, over and over again. Yeah, so let's imagine by way of closing, right? And as again, we're transitioning out of this extremely hard and strange time stretching our imaginations, what will people in 2050 say about the great pandemic of 2020? Right, 2050 is a year where there's predictions that there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean. What will they say about what we were figuring out in our time? Um, who were people in our time becoming? What came through the portal? What was actively let go of? How did people grieve in new ways? How did kindness also spread in ways that are unpredictable and uncontainable? What were people practicing in their everyday lives? And what lessons do we imagine that folks in the future will take from our time, right? Us being those ancestors, right? And if we stretch out further in time travel, right? to so 2120 or 2220, how will they look back on our time? How do we hope or what do we long for of what they will look back on in our time? Well, and part of the, the flip side of imagination is what's unimaginable. That's as we've talked about how narrative power operates, right? Is to make some things normal and possible and some things unthinkable. And imagine the shifts that we could make in our kind of basic moral calculus. Um, and imagine things becoming imaginable. I'd love to envision a future gen future generations that can't even conceptualize what a, a strip mine or a clear cut is um, to make predator drones and prisons and police brutality unimaginable to folks, um, to make the idea of people starving to death on the streets in between mil multi-million dollar condos to make that seem like some distant, dark age nightmare. Um, A science you know, fiction past. That's right. And I mean, for sure, one thing that we can say, um, linking up the different apocalypses we're living through right now, is if we're going to have a future at all, 
let alone a better future. We need to let make the idea of people blindly following an economic system that is cannibalizing the planet and poisoning ourselves and our communities. We need to make that idea unimaginable. There needs to be a dramatic rupture um, in that idea. Mm. May it be so. <laughs> um, one just last note I want to... I want to end up close with is to say that I've been particularly struck over the last two months of how many people I've talked with um, or folks who have shared that they're hearing birds sing more than ever before in their lives in urban landscapes or some people saying they're waking up and hearing birds for the first time ever. And I've been curious about this relationship between reduction of external noise in the outer environment right, and a reduction of perhaps internal noise and people having an altered experience of time and being and being with and tuning into birds. Um, and so as, right, we're now transitioning and as the volume is gonna keep going up um, in the outside world with constant traffic, how might we turn up the volume on are listening and keep paying attention to the breathing of other worlds, worlds that exist and new worlds that may be coming into being, right? So that we can keep uh, nurturing these visions with many, many others to make different futures real and what dreams might be taking root through this 